Uh, welcome, everybody, to our workshop, Mobilizing Memory Leads Reality, which is uh, a part of our uh, research initiative, Contested Histories, Challenging Memories, Immersive Encounters with the Past, which has actually been running thin since uh, 2018 and has been developed by Bergbeck's Interdisciplinary Research in Media and Culture in collaboration with the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. Uh, and in this uh, context, we would also like to thank uh, Experimental Humanities for their support. Now, the first two events we had in that series, um, they're going back to 2018 and 2019. And the first one was around sound. That event was Curating Sound for Difficult Histories in May 8, 2018. And the second one was around images, uh, the performativity of images in the public space in June 2019. So the third event, uh, which we had originally called Staging Difficult Histories Through Immersive Technologies, had been planned for May 2020, so one year ago. But as we all know, the pandemic intervened and it was postponed um, and has now been split into two events. So what we have today, this workshop is actually the first uh, event, the lead up, if you like, to the second event we're going to have on the 7th of June, um, also in the afternoon between 2 and 5.30. And for that event, we also have a group of, uh, of speakers invited, Professor Mandy Rose, Professor Eugenia Chalfi, uh, 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 Dr. Bryce Lees and Cecilia, Dr. Cecilia Sosa, but also some practitioners from Blast Theory and from Anagram. Um, and in that event, we're, uh, it's less uh, of a look back onto what VR experience have also already been produ produced, but more a kind of look forward to what VR can do in the future, hopefully. So both of these events uh, are recorded and uh, today's event is being made available in the context of Bergbeck's Arts Week. Um, so the question we want to put to you is obviously one of the key um, one of the key traits of many nonfiction VR experiences is that they, uh, as we've heard, invite audiences to witness um, the, the suffering or the predicament of a particular individual that really stands in for. A whole group of people affected by wars, conflicts, natural catastrophes, um, displacement, and so on, and uh, with the aim, obviously, to engender empathy. Uh, so, where do you see the potentials that VR can do in that respect, and where do you see the limitations? I know this is a fairly big question, but I thought, given your research and the, the fact that you've all uh, kind of worked on this and published on this, um, I think it would be a nice way to start us off. Um, so this is a question to all of you. I mean, I guess I could start because I have a lot to probably say about this. <laughs> yeah. um, if that's okay. Yeah, I could, I could say, and I, I kind of will kind of say with reference to like many of the works, mainly because of the fact and going through, like I've seen a lot of these before. Um, and I think a lot of them are really key examples, right? I do think the, in kind of going through this and kind of remembering and also seeing ones I hadn't seen before, I, I do think something like the, the USC Shaw Foundation ones probably should be differentiated from a lot of the other ones, in my opinion, at least. And the reason is because I do think that there's a difference between, and this gets into the, the broader idea of even what, empathy might even be understood as, as opposed to say compassion or sympathy, which of course all three of these terms have really massive histories. Um, empathy being actually the one that probably has the, the most recent history being a term that only came around in like 1909, right? Um, but the whole thing that I see it as, and, and I think each of these do very different things that, that lead to different questions. One of, like, are you, the spectator, assumed to be the person that is being represented, which is the case for a couple of these, right? The idea of using VR to put you in the shoes of somebody else versus are you in some way in this sort of immersive environment 
in which you're supposed to identify with somebody on screen. But of course, these videos end up doing like requiring to do something kind of weird, which is you're kind of this spectator from nowhere, right? You're almost like this, this, like, I kind of think it as either you are this sort of metaphysical being, like kind of God almost, or like there, there happens to be like a, somebody that I've, I've written, co-authored things about VR with has described this, uh, Catherine Guinness has described this as like, basically VR presents as, as if you're dead and you are a ghost and you are watching these people from this sort of position in which you can't interact with them. They can't hear you, you're embodied, but there's like no actual relation. So this question of like, what is the relationship between you and on screen? Does that mean you are literally supposed to be embodying the person, therefore identifying with them? Or are you identifying with somebody on screen but can't actually interact? Um, that's obviously different in each case of these. And so if we're thinking about like, what is empathy? What is sympathy? What is compassion? What does that require in terms of some sort of intersubjective relation? And that's why I think the USC Show Foundation ones are different is because they kind of take this tact of, uh, of and I mean, there's part of a long standing mission, right? There's, there's multiple, like the VR uh, experiences are only one instance of them using video and things like that beforehand of say the, I mean, one interpretation I've seen of this that I like from um, Maria Zaluska, uh, who was, who until recently was a PhD student at USC. I like her interpretation, which does frame this in terms of a Levinasian ethics of kinds of otherness of how the, the Shoah Foundation examples are about not reducing the otherness of the other, requiring you to recognize their irreducibility um, and I think there's something important in that. So that's kind of what I'll say at the beginning. I realize there's probably a lot there, but I'm also don't want to talk forever for this. And I probably could. So <laughs> I will stop at that point. Hopefully that doesn't like isn't too all over the place. I'm I'm happy to jump in and um and and pick up some threads of, of Grant's discussion. And I, I particularly want to pick up on um you know, the, the, the importance of taking into account the multiple different kinds of experiences that are on offer in, in various different kinds of, of media and, and also just the different ways that people are positioned within um, these experiences and, and the kind of logic of that. But if we go back to the kind of, you know, the starting point of the, the conversation, so what is it to witness the suffering of another, right? So if we think about what is witnessing, how what's the logic of witnessing and how has the media actually been thought to facilitate an attitude of witness? And for me, I kind of, I, I very often go back with this question to um, Peter's notion of spatial and temporal proximity to events as carrying a moral charge. It kind of, it resonates quite nicely with the, with the documentary idea of the charge of the real. What is it? What is this kind of this charge that, that an image might at some, in some cases carry? Um, that that you know it, it awakens in us a kind of sense of responsibility for what we see. Um, so if I think about this idea of the, the spatial and temporal proximity to events as as being as being kind of um, the starting point for thinking about that, then to my mind the significance of VR and other immersive media is kind of wrapped up in this kind of the promise of of both immersion and presence. So. These are two terms that are very often not particularly clearly defined, um, but when I sort of kind of worked through them, for me, immersion is actually about uh, trying to capture our relationship to the world of the me of, of media, so the mediated world. So rather than thinking of, of a text to be consumed, immersion actually offers us a world to be explored on some level. Right. So it it it, asks, it, it shifts our relationship to to this thing that is mediated. So this gives us the fantasy, and it's a long-standing fantasy, right, with, with the media of stepping into the story and engaging with this kind of mediated world as though from the inside, which, you know, has the potential, and I always said potential because, of course, audiences do weird stuff um, with these things, but it brings about the potential to shift from modes of viewing towards kinds of forms of exploration. And so then if that's immersion, then presence is really about how that makes us feel, right? So the feeling of being there, you know, we could pick up on um, Brenda Laurel's term of sensory first personness, the idea of um, embodied perception or haptic perception or technologies of corporeal, corporeal reality. Um, you know, so thinking about 
the kind of the, the, the feeling, right? So if we think about those two, then, then what we get is we get, you know, this idea of, you know, being within a world um, in some of these works, which are 360 video, this idea of the super abundance of information, the kind of the sense of being wrapped up in the image of being able to see everything and to see it at least theoretically at once um, is really, really quite important to, the, to an attitude of witnessing because it it's an illusion of non-mediation. It's, it's a kind of sense of being able to be touched by the imprint of reality, making the reality another reality concrete to some extent um, through imagining yourself in that environment. Um, and, you know, the kind of ideal there is somehow that you have because it's non-mediated, it's not non-mediated, but because it offers this illusion of non-mediation, it um, it also offers us the illusion of being able to sh to escape discourse, to, es to escape that kind of reduction of reality into a kind of discursive frame, um, which is kind of, you know, obviously an illusion, but it's a powerful kind of illusion, and I think to my mind, um, at the heart of what we um, want to talk about. So, yeah, I think it, in terms of witness, I think those are the, the, the um, important kind of dimensions of these experiences. But of course, we go into these experiences as different people um, with different, you know, we are addressed to different degrees. Um, to my mind, there are two kind of key positionings that are worth working through. Um, we've already talked a little bit about this idea of being in the shoes of another and of being offered a simulated experience that is meant to capture something of somebody else's experience. But there's another notion of empathy that I think is important and operative across some of these works, which is the idea of the face-to-face -face, um, encounter. Um, so, you know, being able to um, be there and be directly addressed visually by another um, and through this address, to somehow kind of, um, you know, feel something of, of their experience um, and to kind of have that interpersonal, or the illusion again of or simulation there of that interpersonal kind of um, bodily effective communication, if you like, um, so that through that kind of that, that interpersonal connection, we are assumed to understand something of the other person's reality. Um, so those, I think those are two, two different things, two different logics. Um, to what's going on um, and you know both offer the possibility in different ways of performing attentiveness and I think performing attentiveness to me is the real promise of this work. Mm. Great thanks. I'm happy to, to come in there I think along with the question of what is empathy the question of what is VR capable of I think is really important here. Um, and um, John Ellis, quite some time ago now, talked about his book documentary Witnessing and, su and suggested that witnessing was a, a, a kind of a, a shift in spectatorship that we kind of had voyeurism before. Um, and now we had this new form of witnessing and documentary that you know, made the observer ethical and complicit. Um, but that witnessing there is this distance observer of, of cinema. One might feel um, personally um in some kind of relationship with the subjects on the screen, but you are still distanced from the screen. Um, and so I think it's interesting that we're still using a lot of this language that we used with the with the televisual when we're talking about VR. And part of that is because of the way these VR experiences are, are shaped in, in very much the televisual, the filmic. Um, and for me, what, what distinguishes at least VR's potential from some of these you know, previous audiovisual formats is that we can do, that we are users and we're not just viewers, um, but also the possibility of responsive systems that we can have, you know, the, the potential of VR is that we can do something, the, res the system can respond to us and we can respond to that and we can have quite an individualised experience of a space based on these kind of constant negotiations between us and the system. Not many people do that, and certainly very few um, of these uh, non-fiction pieces do it. Those that do, it's still quite limited. It's almost I think the Anne Frank one. It's like going to a museum about to pick up you know, that part of a museum for kids where you can pick up the object and touch and play with it. It's it's still building up on these kind of pre-digital experiences. Um, and I've um, questioned, and I actually think that seems to be a limit when we've talked in Holocaust studies and in other formats as well, but the kind of limits of representation, there seems to be kind of 
the the limits of interactivity seems to be the new <laughs> the question of the limits of representation for the 21st century is you know, and you have these co kind of debates about whether you should have games computer games and serious games on on such complex and, and kind of difficult histories um it seems to be this new limit that we we are going to use the technology but we still want them to be quite cinematic or we want them to be interactive stories um and the, I've problematized this notion of immersion in my work and for me it's this kind of utopian idea that we've never really fulfilled and it appears throughout media history the panoramas were supposed to be immersive the renaissance salas were immersive but they weren't really and there was always and I think in all of them and I think we see this in VR that mixed reality has always been the focus of these experiences you're always aware the salas were the kind of illusionary you're looking to see if you could you know see where the fireplace was really there on you know play with the scenery in the panorama you're always shuffling waiting for the next person in front of you to move forward holding the banisters you're always very aware of being situated in your in your real lived world as well as kind of to experience the solution uh, before you I, I i don't think we're ever kind of, kind of fully pulled into um these experiences and for me it's that kind of diddy Uman idea between the semblance and the dissemblance that we're kind of Seeing these people, and again, this relates to the, the immersion to the empathy that we we're, we're kind of like these people. It looks like the real world, but we know it's not because we're my, certainly in my Oculus. I was floating uh, above people. <laughs> if you sit on your sofa, you are above them. Yeah, like this ghost idea that you're you do sort of feel like you shouldn't be there. Or you're, and it's invasive. And um, I know VR has often been referred as this kind of empathy machine, um, but again, yeah, this is empathy—the idea of walking in someone's shoes or being in their spaces. Um, one of them feels kind of inappropriate that we can feel as if we are in a refugee camp. The other one feels intrusive. And I think goes back to lots of these debates in kind of um, humanitarianism and media um, about that kind of colonial white saviour um, invading spaces. And I certainly felt, um, I think it was, uh, I just remember the name of the film. Um, which one was it? Uh, Clouds Over Sidra. We were in the family um, bedroom and you think you know there's a, there are spaces that people now have that can be private perhaps not that frequently and we still feel like we have to invade those spaces we still don't feel like we can um, give people their their, their privacy um, what I did find very really interesting though was um, how six times nine and limbo and sea prayer did something slightly different um, and maybe this is a different idea of empathy. Empathy is as, as an effective experience, which is about feeling strange in our own body or feeling str troubling our own sense of being embodied without making us feel like we're embodied as someone else. So CPRO create, you know, creates a, the 360 becomes this painted canvas bit by bit. Um, and we're not sure where we're, what we're looking at. We're kind of, oh, was something? Oh, we didn't notice that thing had happened. And um uh, and uh, Limbo is quite sketchy and it plays with those quite staccato aesthetics in VR. So that floating thing, it's mentioned in the film. Oh, you feel like you're floating. Oh, you feel like you're invisible. It plays on this. Uh, and I think it really gets to the gist of understanding its limitations at, at, you know, in terms of the technicalities, what they could do with the VR and making that part of the aesthetics and making that part of how VR is making you feel uncomfortable or strange and I think that making strange for me is perhaps has perhaps in these examples been the most powerful and it's often in the examples that don't try to create immersion through photographic realism mm -hmm. it's a more kind of e effective animation um or kind of playfulness um te technical uh, technically as well mm. yeah that, that's fascinating I hope we can come back to uh, you know, look, actually looking at clo more closely at the specific examples you've mentioned. Yeah, Kate. Um, okay, we've well, kind of covered a lot, so I'm like, what can I possibly add? Um, I was kind of um, thinking about uh, Frosch and the witnessing text. I don't think that's been as um, brought up in some of the things that we've been saying, but also, um, yeah, this notion of splitting yourself in two. And Vicky was saying, you know, we're sometimes, well, we're always simultaneously aware of the technology. Um, we're not ever completely fooled that we're present or um, fully immersed into the experience. And um, some of the stuff I've written is how that can be a really progressive form of witnessing that kind of borrows from um, the kind of Jewish context of the Haggadah and how, um, your negotiation into those texts, particularly when um, the technology kind of fails itself. So I speak about, for example, when you try and touch Pinkas in The Last Goodbye, um, suddenly I'm aware of the limitations and I'm drawn back to myself in the museum. 
and it's kind of my commitment to go back into the um to suspend disbelief again and be in that kind of context of him taking me round and um you know I, well I argue that it's a familial connection but whatever an intimate connection a face-to-face -face interaction um is kind of the the commitment it asks of you to suspend disbelief, to imagine, to kind of use Diana's terms, to imagine back to kind of doing Holocaust memory. Um, and this idea that actually sometimes the limits of the technology um, can actually create a kind of productive way to witness, which is that splitting yourself in two and being aware that you're in both of these spaces at once. And that can also kind of counter that uh, problematic notion of being in the shoes or being completely in that personal face-to-face -face interaction. Um, it's kind of a yeah, like a proper distance, I suggest, or like a, a safer distance than assuming that we can be in those shoes or completely in that interaction. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think something I've taken now from all of what you've said, and I hope we can sort of um, hone in a little bit on that, is the question of how are we placed in these different. A VR experiences and as you said it's different for each one uh, uh, obviously for each example um, and maybe I can suggest that we sort of um, do do almost like a bit of a, a close reading um, uh, 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 and let's just start with Clouds of Isidra which has been mentioned. Um, I mean for me I, I find it fascinating because the way it is described um, I assumed that I would be following Sidra, the girl, through um, her life, her everyday life in uh, through the, the, the refugee camp. Um, but what actually happens is you are introduced to Sidra, as we can see, you know, uh, uh, on the top uh, left hand um, uh, still. We are introduced to Sidra uh, and we sit sort of opposite her. And I think it's, yeah, it's uh, uh, what I think Victoria said about in, you know, invading uh, a, a space that is already very limited, a very pri a limited private space. So, but, you know, let's be generous. We could say we are sort of invited in as a guest. Uh, by Sidra and we're sitting opposite her but then she seems to kind of vanish and we are a kind of a, I, I don't know are we are supposed to assume that we're walking in uh, literally in her shoes in her body through the camp because we don't see her anymore and but I was I found that experience very strange because I thought okay, first of all, the perspective doesn't quite fit because I'm very high off the ground. You know, it doesn't fit with the height of Sidra, let's say. Um, and then also I was thinking, well, the camera in this case, obviously it is the camera, it's a 360 degree camera and the person who's, who's, who's kind of operating that camera takes me to places to which Sidra wouldn't have necessarily been able to go. So I doubt that she would be able to go into the man's gym or, you know, and I doubt that uh, the, the boys in the computer room, and I think it's even thematized that she says, you know, the boys don't want us there, the, meaning the girls, they don't want us girls there. And the way the boys interact kind of is very pretty clear that they're not interacting with with a girl um so it, it 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 i find it kind of weird the way we are uh, placed in 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 that in that example or in other examples don't nece doesn't necessarily seem to be um you know it, it doesn't seem to be straightforward and I, i'm i'm sort of interested in the kind of effect that has um and i i wonder you know uh, what, what your thoughts uh, in your experience was when you looked at that example. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I thought of Sidra as, um, you know, kind of reimagining the logic of some pretty standard humanitarian type textualities, um, in a sense. I saw it very much as a piece in which you were invited to imagine yourself not so much as entering as being Sidra, um, because of the the way that the voiceover is structured and the way the whole thing is structured, but that you would, you know, as though you were someone being taken around the camp. Um, I, I agree with you that the um, 
the visual perspective is a little bit unusual, um, although I suspect that has, might have more to do with the kind of emerging skills around, um, you know, knowing how to film in this medium, because mm -hmm. I think that's been a, a really steep learning curve um, for, for folks working with it. Um, so, but yeah, so um, the 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 logic of you know a visit. So I kind of envisage um, Cedra as an encounter. So it's a negotiation of of difference. I, I totally take your point about um, the kind of you know um, invasive stroke colonial stroke you know white savior kind of overtones of that. But I think that is part of uh, humanitarian kind of um, works like this. Um, if I was if I was going to be um, more generous, I would, I would point to two things that I think are significant about CEDRA. Um, one is the kind of um, the way in which VR allows for a re remediation in a, in a broad sense of the kind of the ideal of the encounter as, you know, the sitting on sitting on the ground face to face um, with somebody else and listening to, so performing an attentiveness to their testimony. Um, insofar as you know, this is not perfect, and I would I would totally um, echo Victoria's kind of sentiments that um, you know the immersion is always a kind of mixed and partial and and all the rest of it. But if I think about the logic, what am I being asked to imagine myself doing? I'm being asked to imagine that I am there, to imagine that I am seated opposite this this girl, and that I am paying attention, hopefully. Um, although, as I've written about, you know, I got kind of distracted by the visual offer behind me and kept swirling around. But um, that's probably just says more about me being being heartless. But um, <laughs> so paying attention to, you know, to, to kind of to do that. So that's the first thing that I would say is that kind of that illusion of, you know, and that opportunity to perform that attentiveness. And the other is, um, you know, picking up on um, Lily Chuliraki's um, analysis of news and witnessing and thinking about how it is that news texts um, might negotiate um, difference. And Kate's already mentioned, you know, proper distance. For me, proper distance is a really useful kind of framework for thinking about VR because it allows me to think through, well, hang on a second, how is proximity suggested and how is distance navigated? Because you need both. Um, so in terms of um, the, the encounter with the space of the camp, um, you know, picking up on, on um, Lily Chiliraki's language, I would say it makes the space of the camp concrete in a very particular way. Um, so it's not just Cedra's reality, but the reality of life in this camp is rendered concrete um, in, in, a, in a way that's, um, you know, can be effective. It, I mean, certainly the scale of it can be effective. It can be, you know, it can help you to capture something of, of that reality. Um, but yeah, that's to my mind, that's that's the kind of the, the logic of it. I think there are all those issues around invading space. Um, but, you know, I, it's, it's really interesting with these technologies to be kind of thinking about where are the questions actually genuinely new and where do they actually just kind of pick up on questions that we've been asking for a very long time about what's the logic of humanitarian communication? How do we represent the other? How do we reduce them to a stereotype? Is she just a stereotype of the worthy victim? Well, in my view, yes. Um, but, you know, what's different here is how are we encouraged to imagine ourselves? Mm, mm, mm. Thanks, Kate. Can I just build on what Kate was saying then? I, I think that's one of the, the the really crucial things when we're thinking about a lot of the, these projects is this, I bet, I guess, both immediate archaeology, but kind of a, a broader cultural archaeology that um, many of the issues that they raise aren't new. And I think part of that is because there's a kind of hesitancy to really indulge in an experiment with VR technologies and, and what it really can do beyond being quite cinematic um and for this one sequence for me when, when you I think Suki you said about the, it kind of feeling like a visit and there's a moment at the end where all uh, I think Sidra talks about there being um the camp having more children than adults and all the children run towards is this I think it's in this one it might maybe in another film actually I might confuse two films but the, the, the children all surround the kind of you as the viewer and it really feels like that kind of white saviour thing, you know, this kind of cliche images you have in humanitarian communication with you surrounded by all the children that you've somehow saved. And um, it was a very uncomfortable image. And it, sorry, it might be in one of the other films, so I apologise. Um, but that that kind of image to me, just it's just a lot of repetitions of these historical images. And, you know, there's a point in that, that game, computer games room where she says, oh, I don't know what the boys do in there. Mm. Yet we do, and we're seeing this. And there's this mm. moment when we detach from her narrative. Mm. Um, 
And what Kate was noting there about technical issues, I think the important thing here is about the eyeline of the child and that we do look down. And one of the other films, Limbo, that eyeline is actually played with and there's a kind of um, asylum officer looking down at you and, and you're, you feel that pressure. Um, but here, the, you know, the uncomfortableness of looking down at the child. So we don't get the sense that we're in the point of view visually of the child. But what is quite powerful with this, and I think all of these VR experiences, is that the testimony is, in quite traditional ways, in the voice. Mm. And mm. whatever we are seeing is kind of then framed by that voice. And even if it's not, we're not taking on the person's kind of footsteps or we're not following, it's having them lead us like we do with Pin, uh, Pinta, uh, Pinkas rather, um, in the, the Last Goodbye, mm. um, the voice is framing the images for us and that kind of giving us that subjective anchorage. And I think that's what's quite powerful about all of these. And perhaps it's one of the things that's often sidelined when we talk about VR because it's kind of about reality and the visual that the mm. auditory mm. kind of sidelines in conversations. Mm. Mm. Yeah and the auditory is of course also very different because sometimes we actually hear the voice of uh, the people and sometimes we hear an actor, sometimes we hear their, 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 their own language and sometimes we hear a translation uh, with an accent and have subtitles in act in 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 the VR experience, which is also, of course, obviously something a device we are very used to from documentaries, but might be uh, an alienating experience in a in a VR uh, experience when we are supposed to feel that we are in the space and and to see words floating um, ac across. Um, the, the space we see is obviously, um, you know, sort of works against the photorealism you have been, you, you've mentioned. But that's another element which I find fascinating. So, you know, you were talking about the the, the audio testament we, 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 we're hearing, uh, but we're hearing those in very different ways in, in those different examples. Um, and I find it also interesting how they relate to the images, uh, because sometimes it is, as you say, a photorealistic um, uh, a representation of uh, a space. And sometimes it is like in limbo, um, or um, which you've also mentioned, or actually in uh, um, six, six times nine, um, which are both uh, guard from made in the context of, um, of the Guardian uh, virtual uh, reality experiences, where we actually see, um, at least in parts of, of those VR experiences, the inner, um, the inner reality of, of people um, who are confined to these um, spaces. And um, and I find that very interesting because it is not the it is partly the realism of the space itself because that obviously it says this is how um, an an isolation cell in in U.S. prison in a U.S. prison looks like it's cre it's it's uh, it's an authentic recreation of that but at the same time it says this is how it feels like to be in those in this cell and we're not just getting the audio testimony we're also getting visuals that uh, kind of um, imagine what the psychic reality or the inner reality is of being in these spaces so I, I, yeah I, I was wondering also about about that uh, because that that seems to be a very different way virtual reality experiences can go even the non-fiction ones um where they are based more on on a kind of imaginative encounter with a testimony rather than a, a strictly a photorealist one i think six by nine is a really interesting project for for a number of reasons and and just to kind of pick up on what you were saying that the silka um about this idea of the kind of um, I'm going to use the word simulation because I think simulation is actually a really helpful way of thinking about how these works mimic something of the experience of another. All right. So they don't reproduce it, um, but they do see the, the, you know, the logic of it is that there's something on offer here, which is meant to give you some kind of insight into what it feels like to be in this space. And I think that's really interesting. And for me, um, that's interesting because what it tells it because of what it tells us about 
shifting regimes of truth and the way in which the kind of logic of what John Dovey has written about as first person media is extended through these immersive um, platforms, right? So John Dovey wrote about reality TV in the 1990s and it's the kind of parade of talking heads and said, you know, isn't it really interesting how, um, you know, we have come to understand truth as something that is personal and you know particular not these kind of grand narratives not theme you know, you know big big theories about reality but you know concrete lived experiences of individuals and to my mind the the kind of simulation side of this um actually mimics to you know it can be located within that that overall trajectory we are coming to understand something of the experience of another because we are having a first person albeit simulated um, version of that experience. Um, but what's interesting also about six by nine is the way it does actually also bring in elements of distance, right? Because if you think about the, the simulation of another's experience or aspects of it as proximity, all right, it, it gives you some kind of felt understanding, then distance is always, is also really important. How does it actually put that experience into context? How does it also enable you to understand that you're not actually experiencing what someone else experiences, but you're actually experiencing just a little fraction, right? And actually six by nine has a number of distancing strategies that I think are really important. The first one is it frames the experience as, um, as, as just a kind of something of the experience, right? You know, people have been in here for years, you're going to be in here for nine minutes, right? This is not the real thing. It's just a kind of, you know, this is a fragment of so that's the first thing. But the other thing is um, that what it does do is it makes the voices of others, it uses that audio the, from the audio recordings from the prison, and it uses the voices and testimonies of experts of various kinds to to situate this experience and to make it clear to the, the person who's, who's engaging with the experience what they're experiencing, why it's important, and what it means in the kind of broader term. So you're actually hearing, and you can see it in the screenshots that you grabbed there, um, uh, so, you know, solitary confinement can cause, you know, permanent psychological damage. You hear the voices of experts actually contextualising this experience. And to my mind, that's a really great example of distancing, right? So here I offer you an experience, an illusion. Here I actually place that in context. Um, and that, and that to me is is, is really important. Mm. Could I mention a few things? Because there are so many ideas to kind of talk about in the past few moments. Um, the one thing I really, because I think both Kate and Victoria in their various comments, the way I kind of think about this is, okay, on one hand, yeah, so many of the things that we're talking about with VR, especially here, is not particularly new. Um, if we're talking about the capacities of media to visualize something, right, that's been part of photography, has been part of cinema throughout their entire history. The idea of immersive media, I think Victoria mentioned even like this goes back to like Italian frescoes and things like the Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk is the one that I always kind of draw on, um, which has different points that I think could, could uh, be drawn out from. But the thing that I do think, and this is, gets to what both Kate and Victoria were saying, is how I think about this is these are all existing in terms of a context in which there's a assumed political value to public intimacy. Um, and I think that this, like I first started thinking about this when Victoria was talking about the, the inappropriate seeing of private spaces. But there is something I think that you can say at least um, at least since the 80s, maybe even slightly before then, but of a specific political value towards speaking the self to be worthy of rights, which is definitely the case with a lot of these examples. The idea that to be worthy of rights, to be worthy of recognition as a, as a human, means to speak private experience. It's not just seeing it for yourself, it's the fact that somebody has to speak it, somebody has to say it, versus uh, an abstraction that simply recognizes the other as a human being by default. Um, and I think that's something that is kind of like, is pretty much, if, if we think about a number of these of how they visualize ne necessarily private space, um, does come to the idea of what does it mean for a particular person to be, to be considered to be even like articulated or recognized as a human being. And of course, this sort of this demand to speak um, private 
pr a private truth to speak intimate realities is differential. It's not like everybody has to be in this position to be considered worthy of rights. So to begin with, there's automatically a kind of discursive political formation that frames particular struggles, particular bodies as necessarily defining themselves or necessarily making themselves visible in particular ways. Which, I mean, some of these play with, I think, uh, a number of people have pointed out, play with these or sort of critique these in how the VR simulation itself is derived. But I, I think that's something that kind of is foundational even for a kind of the formation that is about what does it mean for people to be recognized? Now, the other thing that kind of goes back to that idea of like, how does this then relate also to media history with things like the, the I mean, the, the critique of immersivity in the Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk, I mean, like I always kind of end up def not deferring, but sort of like thinking back to like the Adorno Wagner book, which kind of argues that the immersivity, the multimedia spectacle of Wagnerian opera was only possible through a necessary exclusion of particular people. Um, now, and that context was the um, labor, the orchestra, literally in the materiality of the orchestra, or literally in the materiality of the theater. But Adorno, I mean, fairly obviously ends up sort of making an analogy to Wagnerian anti-Semitism with that as well. This kind of immersive media spectacle requires a kind of exclusion. Um, and I think it is necessarily the case with these that the medium has to be excluded, which again goes back to a number of Victoria's points of talking about the medium specificity of VR and how that's oftentimes overlooked, a point that I completely agree with. But I always do wonder about like when it comes to what is represented in these, also what is excluded, what is included, but also what's excluded and what is necessary to be excluded for the simulation for identification to work, which again is an extremely old theme. So that's some of the things that I was thinking about from this discussion. I just wanted to come back on, on the point about saying that there was this kind of invasiveness in the domestic space in, in uh, regarding Sidra, because I think for me, it was at the beginning, as as as, as Soki said, you know, she invites us into the house, but then she is vis visually erased. And then what was previously said about actually that a lot of the audio is translation, um, that then she's also kind of orally erased if it's if it's someone else's voice. So we we're invited into a house, and almost in the film kind of makes her vanish. Um, and then when we return to her domestic space, she's in tears. And the camera moves closer to her and stays on her and talks for her. And at that point in the voiceover, there's a kind of commentary where um, about her, about that she's been here for so long, and that makes her, that makes her upset. Um, and I think that that was what was particularly jarring in that film for me in terms of our positioning in relation to her and this kind of erasing of her and then returning to her when she's in a kind of very vulnerable state as well. Mm. Mm. Um, can I just pick up, uh, pick up on some of the um, of the of, of the issues that uh, were raised uh, here by by Vance and Victoria, um, mo mostly related to the notion of what is included, what is excluded, and um, presence and er erasure, as Victoria uh, mentioned earlier. Um, it's just um, and bringing those issues um, closer to the question of empathy. Um, it's just, um, I'm just wondering to what extent, um, you know, VR as a genre with, with its focus really on immersion um, actually uh, allows um, a, a deeper contextualization of, um, of the subjects that we are encountering. Um, in my sense from, from, from those examples from C uh, Clouds Over Sidra, but also from others is that uh, we are, Plunge, we plunge into this world for a very short time. Usually, I mean, uh, these experiences last for at most 10 minutes and we are given very little information um, about, um, about the, um, the individuals that we are seeing. I mean, we are given maybe a line or two uh, uh, of information, of contextualization, which is usually very broad. Um, and which doesn't really help us to understand their position very well. I mean, uh, in, 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 in relation to Sidra, to Clouds of a Sidra, I was wondering um, why, for instance, uh, the voices of uh, members of her family uh, are not present. Um, why is she singularized in a way? Um, 
um, being detached from from um, you know the, her relations, her most immediate relations uh, of the family. So I was just just to sort of to to to, to bring this um, to a more sort of general question related to to the media in relation to whether uh, it do, it really offers us does it really offer us um, a, a deeper understanding of these individuals, uh, given that we are given very little contextualization of their situation. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is, can we actually empathize with these historical subjects um, when we are lacking um, a deeper understanding of their situation? Um, I was just thinking as you were saying that, like in a lot of these examples, um, you know, maybe there's a privileging of the space. So when we think about the last goodbye, the camp, well, obviously clouds over cedar as well. Um, and I was just thinking as well, a lot of these audio uh, talks and um, particularly I'm talking more probably augmented reality. But if you think about um, here spaces of memory, I think Victoria's written about this, how you get all these kind of fragmented narratives and sound bites of different people. Um, I think that's also true of the audio walk at Goosen, which is, you know, understanding this space and the walk of the camp that's not there anymore. And then also I'm working on um, the liberation at Dachau. Um, and that's kind of a whole audio narrative of various different people. Um, so you don't get this contextualization of the individual. But I think in the mm -hmm. same way, you have a distance to, um, like we were saying earlier about kind of subsuming them in the Western perspective and narcissistic identification, but maybe you get more of an understanding of space, maybe space is contextualized um, rather than the individual. I don't know, mm -hmm. just a thought. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I think Kate makes a really good point there about it, the, the space being contextualized, but I also think that even then we don't get the deeper contextualization and like deeper than a non VR way of doing this. Because I, I, I don't know if other people had the same experience, but I, I rarely felt that the, the, the VR experience was encouraging me to look in the 360 in most of these things. So either there was a there was a an audio cue that I should be you know, looking at the person who's speaking or the you know the sound of the computer games or uh, and so I should be looking at this thing that I can see on screen. Um, or there was something happening automatically where I was already looking. And the only part in cloud uh, clouds over Cedar where th that was different, I found myself where the young boys were wrestling and I was looking at this quite uncomfortably very close up to this long line of young boys who are kind of either awkwardly waving at the camera or kind of trying not to look at it and there was she was talking about wrestling and I was like where's the wrestling and then I looked and it was right behind me uh, and I know obviously they respond to us differently depending on how we're you know, where our eyes are and how we're adjusted to the the set um but I found in also in refugees but I looked behind me there was very little stuff going on or it was quite background stuff so I felt compelled to turn back to um the kind of cinematic 2d style action I didn't I didn't feel like they were playing in the 360. So even for me, the space wasn't really utilized in that way either. And I, I wonder if there is a problem there that if we were to do that too much, then we become, you come back to what I think refugees does, the mass of refugees, the refugees not as individualized. And I wonder if that was a technique the filmmakers were purposely going for, so that they were trying to make us concentrate on either individuals or small groups. Mm. There's also the difference between the distraction, uh, the tension between the distraction and the attention. Also, <clears throat> what Kate's been saying about, you know, uh, one advantage of this VR experience seems to be that we are concentrating. We are, re you know, we feel like we're there. We've invited, we are being invited in and being talked to personally. Um, and are sitting opposite uh, the, the, the girl giving her testimony. But at the same time, the VR seems to encourage uh, the VR experience seems to encourage us to be distracted, you know, and and look around and 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 kind of actually explore the fact that it is a VR experience, which means we can, you know, we can look in different places. Obviously, if we were if somebody was actually talking to you. And you and you were to do that, you know, you you would be a very rude person, you know, you 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 wouldn't be looking around, you know, you would would try to make eye contact and so on. So uh, I think there is a tension there, um, as has already been said, between the VR experience uh, and and the limited kind of um, agency or or, or interactivity uh, it seems to offer uh, with 
hat tracking, you know, being able to just look around and see 360 degree um, uh, environment and the kind of attention we are supposed to give uh, to the testimony and to the person giving the testimony. Exactly. And I think that for me, that came um, into sharp focus with the um, the last whip, the, uh, the last goodbye, um, the the recording that we we put uh, the, the link we we put to, to the recording uh, was actually someone else's sort of um, encounter with Pinkas Guter uh, Guter at uh, Majdanek, and I was surprised actually by how uh, uncomfortable I felt when um, he was um, there was some certain points where where he's describing um, um, his experience of the showers and also when he's um, looking at he's in front of the mausoleum uh, and and um, singing a song to his in memory of uh, of his uh, sister and I could see that the person who was uh, uh, who was uh, experiencing uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, through the VR was actually moving around and looking around the scene um, and not directly at uh, at at, um, at Guter, you know, particularly at that very emotional, intense, intensely emotional moment. Um, and um, yes, it does give us a sense of how other people are experiencing uh, these issues. But also, as Silke mentioned, that there's a uh, there's a um, it's actually in the, the VR itself, it invites you to do that. Um, so uh, I wonder whether how one can, how let's say VR producers would be able to reconcile this, um, this tension, is it possible? Diana, I just wanted to say, yeah, how you've noticed uh, that part where he's singing at the ashes to his sister. Um, my theory of this actually is that um, that's the point where you transition actually back to being a spectator. And um, so just prior to arriving at the mausoleum, um, you follow him. I don't know if people remember, but you walk behind him. He'll no longer address you. So you've had his eye line pretty much the entire time. And then he turns around, you follow him. And I've kind of suggested that this is your transition back from being a surrogate child or a part of the family to now actually you need to get ready to be a spectator. And if you actually think about when he first sings the Kaddish, you kind of have that really uncomfortable moment with him anyway, under the showers. So you're already in that, and then you kind of get it again, but I think you get it as his his child and then you get it as a spectator. And then obviously straight after, um, I mean, we don't know if this is like a technical thing, but when you're at the ashes, you're actually um, kind of above him hovering. And that's why I think the person looks around in that video because it's suddenly a really weird perspective that we haven't had prior to that um, singing section. And then by the time you're back in the park, obviously the little boy strolls up and plays with his hat on the scooter and it's completely relieved you of that surrogate child position. Um, so I find that there's parallels between those two different songs that he sings at different times and they're almost as uncomfortable as each other, but I think you're invited to experience them in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just come in, because I, I think that's a really, really important point that Kate's made there about um, this idea of the fluidity of your positioning within these experiences and the fact mm. that it isn't just a, a, a singular kind of thing. Um, and and just picking up, Diana, that question that you asked about the tension, and I think Silke also mentioned it as well, this tension between, you know, how can VR producers, um, you know, navigate this tension between the spectacle of VR and that, you know, inviting an exploration of a world, you know, so a world to inhabit. If it's immersive and it's a world to inhabit, you know, then it invites your kind of visual, um, you know, uh, your visual exploration with this idea of paying attention. And I, I'm going to be really, really rude and, and kind of bring in another work that wasn't in the collection, but one that I think, that, you know, I think is really, really important for um, the way in which it invites um, reflection on that question. And that is Zohar Kafir's testimony. This is actually a piece about um, survivors of sexual assault and there are five survivors of sexual assault um, within within this experience and they, they talk about their experience in different ways. But what's really interesting about it is the way in which the experience it, itself actually asks you to pay attention and it kind of it tutors you to pay attention mm. um, to the difference, just some minute little, you know, the kind of the tiny detail Right? You can't, um, you know, you really do You find yourself drawn to these individuals. So there are five individuals and you can trace their stories and they're kind of knitted together through themes. But what it doesn't do, 
is it doesn't put you into a kind of rich visual spectacle. Like you're in the dark with five people around you um, and you are invited to pay attention to them. The thing is, if you turn away from somebody, their voice dies away and they become less colourful. Um, and so actually, you know, you, the, as you pay attention, the richness of your understanding of the art. Now, you know, I preface all of this by saying I think VR is an incredibly thin medium and I don't think you get the same kind of depth of understanding as you do through um, other modes of, of kind of storytelling and representation. Um, nevertheless, I think this work is interesting for the way it attempts to try and get you to engage with another's experience, kind of, you know, you have to look at them, you have to look at them in the eye, they're life size, they look like, you know, you, you are there having this kind of, you know, you're in, in black void with them having a face to face kind of moment. Um, and the more you look at them, and the more you are, you know, um, noticing those details, the hands, the way that they are holding themselves, the more they become coloured and real, you're like colouring them in um, with your attention. Um, and I think that's, it's an interesting experiment. You know, I'm not going to, I don't necessarily want to proclaim any of these things, you know, great or not great, but they're interesting for what they tell us, right, about, um, you know, witnessing and, and receiving testimony in this sense. Mm -hmm. Can it be a little bit uh, provocative around this idea of distraction and attention? Uh, and I really want to follow up on that VR project you just mentioned, Kate, that sounds really fascinating. I haven't, I've never seen it. Um, but there was a, there's a, a book, and I'm trying to recall the name off the top of my head here. I think it's uh, Ailish Wood. Um, and she talks about dispersed attention with the digital, and she tries to move away from this idea of distraction and tension, and that a lot of the discourse around the digital and distraction comes from people that just don't like the digital. Um, and the book's called Digital Encounters, if I remember <laughs> correctly. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, and I wonder if, the, if we are finding VR distracting in some of these projects, maybe it's the wrong medium for what these projects are trying to do. That VR to me isn't really about um, looking very closely at, at another. It could be about the effective experience. And I think some of these films like a six by nine do that where there's no, there's, there is no person that you see on screen. It is about the space and it's about your affective experience of the space and playing with the, um, the kind of, yeah, the, the, the feeling of that space rather than it's photorealism only. Um, and I wonder that you know what might might make VR useful for um, thinking about witnessing is if in examples where the landscape is seen as a witness, exploring landscape as witness rather than exploring person. And I mean, one of the ways reasons that video testimonies are so powerful is that they're normally shot in medium shot, and it's see you see the gestures of the person, you see the face, you're able to see the details of the person's way of expressing themselves. VR seems to me, if you can have a space which you can wander around, um, and I think that's what makes, um, I'm, sorry, I'm just reminding myself of the titles, um, Sea Prayer particularly effective because it uses the 360 space as a canvas. And it's, you know, the, the, the picture you've got there in the middle, um, you know, of the house and the the green um, is is drawn up bit by bit. There's hardly anything on screen when we come into the space, and we look around. And I, first of all, I was like, oh, not another one of these films that can't be bothered with the 360. And then I sort of realised I was my head was being I was sort of doing an exorcist <laughs> movement with my head, and then on my knees on the sofa going around the other way. Um, but it it was about the spatiality, and VR is a spatial medium, and I think that's perhaps where some of these projects do go wrong um, in being too much about the person and those stories need to be told and I think they're very very important but I, again I think it's this clash in what is the medium good for and there is a and this kind of overzealous love for oh VR's the next best thing we better go use it let's make a thing. <laughs> One of the upshots of this idea of the empathy machine is that people are being motivated by this idea of empathy to think about what sorts of relationships and you know and works like testimony I think point towards okay well maybe there is something that you know um we can start to play around with in terms of what it might mean to to receive testimony in an immersive media you know is there something about donning a headset and taking yourself away from distraction and actually paying attention to somebody else's story and to the nuance of their experience is that something um you know, how do these works negotiate proximity and distance in ways that might be productive? Um, and I think, you know, what we've seen across all the works that we've looked at is that, you know, there are there are moments, there are opportunities, there are things to, to be explored and, and to take further. So, I mean, I, you know, 
again, yeah, nothing profound or, or, or new, but yeah. just, um, you know, I, I'm very, I'm kind of optimistic. And I think you're right. That, so that it's, it's, it's an urgent question because, um, you know, yeah, we, we have this, we have opportunities at certain points in time. And, and I think, you know, this is one of those points in time. I guess, um, yeah, again, nothing profound, but, you know, we haven't really thought about this as, you know, even just a preservation tool at the very minimum. You know, it's something we can go back to when the survivors aren't here. It's a form of testimony. You know, we have our video archives. We have all of these things throughout history. You know, will this be something we return to or not um, regarding even just as Pinkus Goodson example, you know, him in the space? We have people who have talked about the filming experience. Um, Stephen Smith has got all these background things. All of these are experiences that are a byproduct of VR that still might mean something that we can't really see yet. But obviously, you know, the anticipation of entering like a post survivor era or, you know, with hindsight, um, maybe it will be something that we see as preservation. I would just say that I'm, I, I think when you said for the next one that uh, people from Blast Theory are going to be talking about future ideas, I am just intrigued to hear what uh, they would say because I think their work is some of the most like interesting in terms of utilizing the material qualities of new technologies in really interesting and effective ways. The thing I would probably add to this though, I'm going to be a little pessimistic I think, is in the extension of, of and once we see more and more instances of VR for ostensibly social good, ostensibly humanitarian purposes, I think that also is going to create like, or we might see things that are VR, aside from gaming, um, uh, for deliberately antisocial purposes as well. And I'm thinking explicitly here, I have a co-authored piece about like Jordan Wolfson's real violence art uh, piece, which is kind of the antithesis of everything that we've talked about here. And so I do kind of, but, but goes back to a more um, salacious, understanding of visuality and haptics and media is creating experiences that one wouldn't be able to have otherwise. And so I think that this is maybe we could say it's like there's a kind of pharmacology to it if you want to use that term. But is if if it becomes more able to create identification for humanitarian purposes, it probably will also be able to create the inverse as well, I think. And so I think that's probably something to keep in mind for better or worse. <laughs> Yes, I have one slightly pessimistic thing about the future, one perhaps more utopian and more positive and proactive. Um, one, and I think this was kind of raised in your uh, your, your notes you know, and the examples that you, uh, Dana and, and, and Silke, that you provided for us and the structure for that, which was fantastic. Um, and also the kind of caveat that you said, you know, you wanted to find VR experiences that were accessible for everyone. That there's a big issue there that we didn't have to do this when we were studying television or film or advertising you could just send or you, or you probably organize a screening where you wouldn't send people links <laughs> before the 90s um you know you set up a screening and everyone could just watch them even to do that with vr you'd have to have each individual do it with one headset you'd have to buy 10 headsets if you want 10 people there um you know, Google glasses are fine but you know even the gear which i used to have just doesn't have the same ability to do stuff with the same functionality and it's clunky as you know, other headsets and I, I do wonder whether it will be another kind of 3D thing that everyone will just constantly be going we, yeah we're going to make we are going to make this next big thing and then in a few years it will kind of disappear a little bit and kind of simmer and then come back again and then but never really quite be the thing I remember buying a 3D television I don't know probably nearly a decade ago and be like oh yeah it's gonna be, everyone's going to be in 3D no it's not no it's like two things on 3D <laughs> on the BBC and then it just sort of all dissipated again and we had these 3D glasses unnecessarily in the house on the other side I think yeah we've raised lots of questions around whether this is the appropriate medium, if it is, how is it? Yeah, you know, how you know, what is particularly new about VR, which I think is so important with this idea of new media, it's you know, grants. Uh, yeah, it's eloquently shown a lot of these conversations were happening about other kinds of art and other forms of cultural experience. Um so I and I think a lot of people are playing and experimenting and 
trying to figure it out. And I wonder if actually more spaces like this, but spaces that are between creatives, computer scientists, um, you know, tech people, designers, curators, whatever, humanitarian people that work in the you know, humanitarian sector, academics, and having these difficult conversations where those terms that we question and all have different definitions of that we come to guidelines and ideas about how things should be. Um, and I think I know from people I've spoken to in the Holocaust kind of heritage or memory sector, um, that has been one of the things they've said that we don't have any guidelines for what's appropriate or even how these systems work. We are just playing. So we go get ourselves a 360 camera and we figure out how it works. But that's really limited because you know, VR can do so much more. And that computational side of it disappears because people are familiar with the visual cinematic elements of it. And so they stay within that kind of, I guess, the rhetoric or discourse of those other media that are familiar to them. And I think having those difficult, debating, angry, lively conversations between sectors as such, and um, it would be really important for thinking through these questions. Mm. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I mean, both from Diana and myself, uh, thanks for joining us today. And it, it was a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much uh, 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 as certainly I did. Um, and I very much hope uh, that you sort of join us for this ongoing uh, conversation and that we will be able to invite you back in one form or another um, to keep this going, uh, something we've just scratched the surface of. So thanks so much for, for joining us and, uh, and I'll hopefully see you soon. Thank you as well, this was great. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for hosting and thank you everyone.